Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a vast pleasure to see so many of you here. Um, it's also my vast pleasure to introduce uh, Master Robert Buckland, QCMP. Um, Robert went to bar school uh, a little while after me. Uh, unlike me, he was the prize winner for advocacy in his year. Uh, he was called to this end in 1991, practiced in Wales, and uh, was appointed a recorder in due course in 2009. He was all set for a shining career at the bar, um, but life became rather more complicated for Robert than it ever would for me. He was selected as the Conservative candidate for South Swindon in 2004 and succeeded eventually in overturning a huge Labour majority and becoming a Member of Parliament. And such was his esteem that he was selected early on in 2014 to become the Solicitor General. Um, he was kind enough then to accept our invitation for him to become a bencher of this inn. Um, I've seen a lot of Robert over the years because he's come along to bar council meetings. And I must say, his attendance has been absolutely assiduous. Not that many people want to turn up uh, on Saturday mornings to sit there and listening to various of us in the profession talk about ourselves. But Robert has turned up really Saturday in, Saturday out. And we're really very, very grateful to him. Uh, that's on top of a packed life anyway. Not many of us here can say that we spent quite a lot of time with the Prime Minister today. Uh, you'll be reading tomorrow in the papers about just how action-packed Robert's day has been. And um, I must say, I thought my life was busy until I started hearing what Robert had been up to. Um, now, Robert is here to talk to us about the role of the law officers of the Crown, um, about which, of course, being one, he knows an awful lot so it will be a great pleasure um, and a privilege and an education, I suspect, for most of us to listen and find out all about them. Um, can I just finish with this personal note on Robert? I've always known him to be the, the calmest of men. I'd love to see his expression, though, when in a few days' time we see England demolish uh, oh. Wales at Cardiff. Robert. I think not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Master Reader. And I think for the purposes of Saturday's game, I am the Solicitor General for Wales and England in that order. But it is a great pleasure, Master Treasurer and fellow benchers and members and guests to our inn. Uh, and frankly, it's, a little, it's more than a little unnerving for me to be addressing you from this spot tonight, because the last time I did this was nigh on 30 years ago when, as a law undergraduate from uh, Durham, which, uh, as Master Treasurer knows, is a dearly, dearly cherished institution, uh, I was competing in the final of the in InterVarsity debating competition. In fact, I'd done that on two occasions, uh, but modesty forbids me from saying any more about it. I've been a member of this inn for nearly 32 years, and well remember and appreciate the support that I was given uh, by benches of the day. Well, I say of the day because some of them happily are still with us. And that's one of the great things about this inn. It's that sense of continuity uh, and that sense of uh, the past being the present. I sound a bit like T.S. Eliot there, but that's important to me and important as well in my current role as a law officer. Now, I regard it as a particular honour to have been included in this lecture series. I wasn't quite press-ganged, Master Reader. Uh, rather, I made my usual mistake of uh, saying yes, which, as my wife and family will tell you, has been a serial weakness of mine throughout my life and probably led me into public service in the first place. Uh, now, for those of you who are hoping for some sort of uh, John Julius Norwich chronological and exhaustive tour of the law officers, um, a la his rather wonderful history of the popes, you're going to be in for a disappointment. I thought perhaps it would be more profitable to identify some key themes and weave what I hope will be some entertaining historical examples into them. But rather like the BBC, I am here to inform, 
as well as entertain Pache, Lord Reith. Above all, I want to leave you with a sense of what the law officers actually do, what they represent, and indeed what the future may hold for them. Having now served as Solicitor General for nearly five years, I'm in clear danger of becoming the institutional memory in my department. Uh, but the first and foremost point I wish to make is about the excellent quality of the civil servants in our small but perfectly formed office. Uh, 49, that's not the number of steps to my office, which recently were subjected to exponential reduction as we moved from the eight-storey behemoth of 20 Victoria Street to the more compact first and second floor of the Victorian Gothic splendour of the sanctuary, nestling as we do in the shadow of the west front of Westminster Abbey. Oh no, that's the number of lawyers and private secretaries we have in our office. Small, as I said, but perfectly formed. The team undergoes pretty regular refreshment, but we are lucky to be perceived as a destination of choice for the talented and the energetic. And I never fail to be impressed by the quality of the support both the Attorney General and I receive. My team, who spend their time either working with us in the sanctuary or in our rooms in Parliament, situated conveniently just off central lobby and as near to the Lords as the Commons, and you'll understand the symbolism of that in a moment, uh, the team provide me with good advice. But ultimately, the decisions are for the law officers alone. And they won't always accord with the advice given, I can tell you. Uh, modesty forbids me for saying any more about that, but in my personal experience, I haven't yet been proved wrong. But I'm also profoundly grateful to Treasury Council, who with swiftness and great skill provide both the attorney and me with comprehensive and authoritative advice week in, week out. What then are the themes that I shall address? Well, firstly, I will speak about the role of the law officers in Parliament. Secondly, the evolution of our role in government. And finally, a brief look at our current duties. Her Majesty's Government has two law officers of England and Wales, the Attorney General and his effective deputy, the Solicitor General. Now, for clarity's sake, I should say that when I talk about the Attorney, I'm also talking about the Solicitor, because the two have essentially become one since the Law Officer Act of 1997. Now, pursuant to that Act, any Law Officer function exercised by the Solicitor is treated as if it is done by the Attorney. And prior to that, the solicitor could only carry out the attorney's duties, uh, could carry out the att attorney's duties, but there had to be specific permission for this to be done in each instance, which frankly was rather burdensome. Now, the attorney and I have numerous jobs. We provide legal advice to the government. We superintend several departments. We act as guardians of the rule of law and the public interest which is an aspect of our role that encompasses numerous functions in itself. And since the formal devolution of justice powers to Northern Ireland back in 2010, the England and Wales law officers are also, also the United Kingdom government law officers in Northern Ireland. Uh, that's the office of the Advocate General, and we exercise functions there as well. The third UK government law officer is the Advocate General for Scotland, who is currently Lord Keane. Uh, he advises the Westminster Government on Scots law, European Human Rights Convention issues, and constitutional matters. Due to their medieval origins, the offices of the attorney and the solicitor are, shall we say, constitutionally peculiar. So peculiar are they that when a prime minister resigns along with their ministers, it's only the law officers, plus some senior whips in both houses, who hold titles within the royal household, who remain in office. So for about an hour or so in July 2016, about seven of us formed the government of the country, with the Queen as our head. I have to admit that during that albeit brief period, I was sorely tempted to test the limits of our constitution. But I resisted the temptation because by the time I'd plucked up the courage to do so, a new Prime Minister had been appointed, and we were in the throes of a reshuffle. Government reshuffles are strange things, I can tell you. I've been through many of them 
They're traumatic for backbench MPs, but there's only one worse place to be, and that's as a serving minister. But I've survived more than my fair share of them to tell the tale. Most historians agree that the office of attorney, one of the oldest in our constitution, was foreshadowed by the appointment of Lawrence Del Brock in about 1247 to sue the king's affairs of his pleas before him. He attended the Lords, the House of Lords, to give legal advice and litigated on the king's behalf. And his briefs ranged from recovering land to investigating homicides. For meeting a manifold assortment of duties, he was remunerated to the grand sum of £20 a year, barely sufficient nowadays to have one's tapestry restored or oxyoke varnished, you may think. But Brock's tenure cast a rough mould for the office of attorney. However, the practice of appointing a single Atonatus Regis to oversee the king's legal affairs fell into abeyance in the 14th century and only resumed right at the end of that century when William Loddington regained general supervision of the king's legal affairs. It was in 1461 that we see first use of the title Atonatus Generalis. It was first used in the letters patent of John Herbert's appointment. And also then in 1461, Richard Fowler was appointed King's Solicitor. That is the precursor to the title of Solicitor General. Uh, that specific term was first used in 1515 to describe the authority vested in John Fort. Now, in the early days, both the law officers exclusively served the sovereign. It was during the reign of Henry VIII that they were regularly summoned to the upper house to advise on points of law and to conduct trials, although they had no responsibility for the determinations uh, within that upper house. Now, their main tasks were to advise and to act as a go-between between both Houses of Parliament, carrying bills and messages from Lords to Commons, and then drafting, framing and amending bills during their passage through Parliament. And as the Commons grew in its constitutional importance throughout the 16th century, members remained rather suspicious of the attorney, who was seen as a servant of the Crown and the Lords. Indeed, it was the solicitor who first made the move from Lords to Commons. It was in 1566 that the then solicitor, Richard Onslow, was elected Burgess of Steening in Sussex. The Queen, eager to have Onslow made Speaker of the Commons, dispatched the controller of her household to invite members of Parliament to permit him to take his seat. His subservience to the Crown was seemingly no obstruction to his participation in the affairs of the Commons, where he was permitted to take his seat and was promptly elected Speaker. Now, the records are unclear as to whether he managed to negotiate an increase in the £20 annual salary for his additional labour. But thereafter, we see a cons consistent overlap in the incumbency of the role of the common speaker and the solicitor general. There was one notable exception in 1601 when Mr. Solicitor Fleming was considered too lawyer-like and ungenteel for the, solicitor, for the speaker's chair. I, I wonder what they would have made of proceedings nowadays, but I think uh, diplomacy means I should stop there. The attorney's eligibility to sit in the Commons was twice examined by the Committee for Privileges in the early 17th century. Now, on the first occasion, they failed to reach a conclusion, but the Commons Journal records that the attorney ventured to take his seat, and I quote, by connivance. Doesn't really sound like a, a very satisfactory state of affairs, does it? But the issue was then re-examined in 1614, where the Commons expressed disquiet disquiet about having Francis Bacon, a staunch protagonist for the Crown, who, uh, to, for inclusion among their ranks, following his promotion from solicitor to attorney general. The committee agreed that Sir Francis could remain in the Commons for the duration of that Parliament, but that no attorney would ever do so in the future. And it was that convention that lasted until well after the Restoration into 16, the 1670s. So having assumed a relatively settled place in the Commons, the force of the Lord's writ was somewhat reduced. 
and occasional obedience to it was viewed as a quite injurious snub by members of the Commons, as illustrated by an incident that led to the impeachment of an erstwhile member of this very inn. In 1642, amid the escalating tension of the Long Parliament, Charles I ordered the attorney, Sir Edward Herbert, to repair to the Upper House to charge Lord Kimbolton and several prominent Commons members with high treason having allegedly incited a Scottish invasion and stirred up a London mob against the king. To his great surprise, the attorney found himself in the position of the person accused when he was consequently impeached and committed to the fleet prison for breaching the privileges of the commons. Now, similar incidents occurred until the attorney and solicitor ceased responding to the Lord's writ at the turn of the 18th century. Despite ceasing to fulfil their writ as advisers to the upper house, the law officers continued to act as counsel before their lordships. And a notable example is from the last century, in 1935, when the Attorney General, Sir Thomas Inskip, and the solicitor prosecuted Lord de Clifford, who had been indicted for manslaughter, the last instance of a peer exercising his right to be tried by his fellow peers and the Lords. Unless, of course, you count the imaginary but riveting trial of the scheming mass murderer Louis Dascoigne Mazzini, 10th Duke of Chalfont, by his peers. Mazzini, consummately played by Dennis Price in the 1949 Ealing classic Kind Hearts and Coronets, was tried before their lordships for murder. But his conviction was overturned after evidence emerged just moments before he was due to be hanged, although to his chagrin he had left his incriminating memoirs in his prison cell. But I digress. As legal advisers to the Crown and government, law officer time has historically been consumed by advising on proposed government policy and legislation. Now, I'm not able to comment on individual pieces of advice because of the Law Officers' Convention, which protects legal privilege between the law officers and the government, just as in the same way privilege between lawyer and client is protected. Much of the day-to-day -day drafting and amending of government proposals is, and has for some time, been undertaken by lawyers of the government legal service. But yet, if, if one looks at the volume of legislation from a given parliamentary session, and presumes that a law officer has advised at least on its preparation for passage through Parliament, then that gives you an idea of the time that we spend upon the government's parliamentary business. It is considerable. That's not to say, however, that we are perennially, perennially speaking in the House uh, dealing with each bill. I indeed, the participation of law officers in debates before the Commons developed slowly and depended on circumstance and personality. At one extreme was Sir Frederick Pollock, who was attorney in the 1830s. He spoke on such a paucity of occasions, uh, dealing with cumbersome and legally complex legislation, uh, that frankly, uh, there didn't seem to be any real contribution from the law officers uh, to any regular degree. But the other extreme is illustrated by Gladstone's eulogy for his then Solicitor General, Richard Bachel, who supported the Succession Duty Bill of 1853. Now, writing in 1855, when I think Gladstone was still at the Exchequer, he declaimed, and I quote, that the memory of the Succession Duty Bill is to me what Inkerman may be to a private of the guards. You were the sergeant from whom I got my drill and whose hand and voice carried me through. Praiseworthy words indeed. The law officers are and always have been required to manage legislation of gravity. So, for example, Sir Rufus Isaacs guided the Parliament Act of 1911, the Official Secrets Act of that year, and the Government of Ireland Act in 1914 through Parliament. And similarly, uh, my, uh, one of my mentors, Sir Geoffrey Howe, Solicitor General in the early 1970s, dealt with copious and weighty legislation. He is best remembered for taking the European Communities Bill through the Commons prior to accession to membership, but he also took the Industrial Relations Bill, which was an extremely controversial piece of legislation through all of its common stages. Shortly before he died, Lord Howe told me that being Solicitor General was the happiest time he had in government. He quite clearly loved the cut and thrust of committee. And so do I.
You might have noticed a familiar face contributing repeatedly from the front bench when the European withdrawal bill was being debated by the Commons, both uh, in 2017 and last year. That's the fourth bill that I have helped through Parliament, uh, notably the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016, uh, which obviously relates to surveillance and how government uh, is held to account for that, but was another major piece of legislation that I helped steer through. And in Parliament, the law officers are also ex officio members of the Commons Privileges Committee and can be called upon to give advice and support in particular cases involving allegations of breach of privilege. However, our historic role as legal advisers to Parliament, which was the original purpose of our writ in the Lords, has frankly been supplanted by the growth of the Clerks Network and the emergence of Speaker's Council largely because of the tension between our role as advisers to Parliament and our role in government. The most recent instance of legal uh, advice or a legal position being outlined uh, to Parliament dates from the 1980s, when successive attorneys gave non-partisan advice to the House on the issue of industrial relations and picketing in particular. So when law officers speak in the Commons, it's chiefly as members of Parliament, and the government using their special competence and authority to deal with legal issues that arise in interpreting the provisions of a new measure. We answer questions every six weeks or so, just as every other departmental minister does, on matters that are relevant to our brief, matters such as the Crown Prosecution Service, the Serious Fraud Office, and the government legal department. Very recently, the attorney made a statement and answered questions about his advice on the EU withdrawal agreement. Although I have to say, with respect to my colleagues, that precious few of the questions asked actually related to the detailed substance of his letter to the Prime Minister at all. Such are the vagaries of the Commons. Moving then on to the law officers and government. First of all, dealing with Cabinet, the law officers have not historically received a standing invitation to cabinet. Now that's not a, an insult to our status, but rather it is necessary to ensure that we remain detached, lest the independence of our advice be hampered by an attachment to any policy that we may have helped devise. Some exceptions to this rule occurred in the early 20th century. In 1912, Sir Rufus Isaacs became the first Attorney General to hold membership of Cabinet, probably because Prime Minister Asquith wanted to assuage him uh, when he felt aggrieved at being passed over for the position of Lord Chancellor. Now that practice continued until 1928, when the Attorney's formal Cabinet rank was permanently ceased, because the perceived diminution of the Attorney's impartiality had indeed been criticised in the House and among legal professionals. Nowadays, the law officers have a voice in Cabinet when there are legal and constitutional issues at stake. Litigation, particularly the conduct of criminal proceedings, is another duty that historically captured much of the energy of a law officer. Such prosecutions were almost exclusively conducted on the Crown's behalf, save one notable prosecution led by Cromwell Solicitor General Sir John Cook against none other than Charles Stuart, Charles I. After the restoration, Mr. Solicitor Cook was rewarded for his efforts with execution for high treason and regicide. The only law officer known to have been hanged, drawn and quartered so far. Cook was really a courageous victim of schadenfreude. His predecessor, Edmund Prido, had balked at the prospect of prosecuting the king and promptly resigned. Having dodged the metaphorical bullet and the literal gallows, Prido was appointed Attorney General in April of 1649, just four months after the regicide, and served the Commonwealth until his death in 1659. No moral tale there to be told, it would seem. In less extreme cases, the early law officers acquired a reputation, I'm afraid to say, for behaving somewhat irascibly and, dare I say, unscrupulously when discharging their prosecutorial duties. 
the uh, tome uh, State Trials of 1730, written by Solomon Emlyn, provides us with a vignette through which we can view such behavior and the consequent nadir of public esteem for the law officers. In his book, Emlyn roundly condemns the bloodhounds of the crown, and I quote, who with rude and boisterous language abuse and revile the unfortunate prisoner, and who by force or stratagem endeavour to disable him from making his defence. He may have had in mind Richard Rich, who was Solicitor General from 1533 to 36. Rich, while assisting the attorney Sir Christopher Hayes in the trials of the Bishop of Rochester and Sir Thomas More for treason, entered the witness box and gave evidence of admissions made by the accused in the course of friendly conversation. Sharp practice indeed, some would say. More than that, others would rightly say. And we know the result for both the bishop and for more. And again, there is no moral tale to be told about Sir Richard Rich because he became Lord Chancellor and died in his bed. Sir Edward Cook, former member of this inn, and an incisive and great jurisprudential mind, famously browbeat Sir Walter Raleigh in his trial of 1603 for complicity in a plot to place Lady Stuart on the throne. I'm afraid it wasn't Cook's finest hour. He harangued Raleigh, exclaiming amidst a tirade of vitriol, and I quote, Thou art a monster, thou hast an English face, but a Spanish heart. And he called Raleigh the most vile and execrable traitor that ever lived. I'm glad to say that uh, from there we see an improvement because the law officers consistently started to observe higher standards of professional propriety when presenting cases. Indeed, the appointment of Sir William Garrow as solicitor and then attorney in the administration of Lord Liverpool in the early 19th century was, I like to think, a tacit approval of his work in pioneering defence advocacy and the all-important burden of proof in what we now recognise as the criminal trial process. And yet the law officer's role as public prosecutors remained susceptible to disapprobation for different reasons, predominantly the perception of political interference. Nowadays, prosecutorial independence is safeguarded as the Crown Prosecution Service conducts the majority of serious criminal cases out with the ambit of any suggestion of political meddling. The issue of politicised prosecutions has emerged on many occasions. In 1793, Sir John Scott, who was later Lord Eldon and whose portrait hangs behind my desk in the Commons, had succeeded Sir Archibald MacDonald to the office of attorney. Sir Archibald had commenced a prosecution against Thomas Paine in 1792, that famous case on a charge of sedition for his publication of The Rights of Man. On assuming office, Scott had to decide whether to continue a similar prosecution for seditious words allegedly published by an attorney named John Frost. Thomas Erskine, who was later remembered as a Lord Chancellor, represented Frost at trial. He intimated that Mr Attorney Scott had merely continued the prosecution because it had been devolved upon him by his predecessor. Sir John protested. He gave a rousing rebuke to Erskine, during which he declaimed that no man ought to be in the office who would hesitate to say, my conscience must direct me, your judgment shall not direct me. An eloquent espousal of his independence of thought. And similarly, in 1794, during the treason trials, Sir John unsuccessfully prosecuted three men for allegedly inciting radicals to levy war against the king. Upon their acquittal, erroneous rumours circulated that the attorney had recommended a prosecution for the lesser charge of sedition, but had been overruled by cabinet. Although in both cases the rumours were uncorroborated and probably baseless, baseless, they illustrate how, by occupying a dual role as a minister and a public prosecutor, the law officers were frankly vulnerable to obloquy arising from such accusations, whether they were true or not. And one particularly controversial mechanism for commencing prosecutions was what was known as the ex officio information, 
Uh, that was a criminal information that the attorney could file without leave of the court and without the need for presentment or indictment for misdemeanors of a lesser degree than felony. Now, Blackstone states that their use was confined to such enormous misdemeanors as peculiarly tend to disturb or endanger the Queen's government, namely sedition, riots, and libels on ministers of the Crown. And in 1831, Mr. Attorney Denman was called upon to prosecute agrarian rioters from the southwest of England. While investigating, he observed that the rioters had been influenced by the writings of the pamphleteer William Cobbett. He duly filed an ex officio information against Cobbett for criminal libel. Now, by the time of his trial, the denunciation of the Whigs had earned him immense popularity. Unable to agree on a verdict, the jury was discharged, and the annual register for 1831 records that Mr. Attorney Denman gladly entered a nolly prosequi. More of that power a little later. Moving forward then to 1903, it was the then Prime Minister Arthur Balfour who acknowledged that politics and prosecutions ought to be disassociated when he stated that it was not in the power of government to direct the Attorney General to direct a prosecution and that the Attorney General, when making such considerations, ought to act in the interest of all, a precursor, if you like, of the public interest test. Nevertheless, the use of the ex officio information to commence criminal prosecutions persisted. As late as 1911, the Attorney General Rufus Isaacs filed uh, such a, a device against the journalist Edward Milius, who had published that George V was a bigamist. This was the last occasion on which the attorney used his prerogative to file an ex officio information. It finally met its demise with the Criminal Law Act of 1967. Uh, which many of us will remember more for the alibi notice uh, and the, uh, formal the formal admission procedure. It was really the Campbell case of 1924 that brought the problem of the janus face nature of the attorney into very sharp focus indeed. In fact, it brought the downfall of an entire government. John Ross Campbell was the acting editor of the Workers' Weekly, it was, that was the putative organ of the Communist Party of Great Britain. In July of 1924, the Workers' Weekly published an article addressed to the fighting forces, in which soldiers were exhorted not to turn their guns on fellow workers, to smash capitalism forever, and turn their weapons on their oppressors. The day following publication, the Attorney General, in the minority Labour government, the first Labour government, Sir Patrick Hastings, consented to a prosecution under the Incitement to Mutiny Act of 1797. Reportedly, while Sir Patrick and the DPP discussed the case, significant public interest factors, such as the likelihood of the erosion of military discipline, went entirely unmentioned. Members of the Commons were somewhat indignant about what was, in their view, a prosecution for an article simply discouraging soldiers from allowing themselves to be used in industrial disputes. The temperature rose yet further when it was disclosed that Campbell, a decorated First World War veteran who'd lost both his feet in action, had been working as editor only temporarily. In August, Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald summoned the attorney to review the Campbell case papers. The Prime Minister enjoined Sir Patrick to discontinue the prosecution if certain undertakings could be obtained from Campbell. And that was an opinion that was then reinforced by the Cabinet when it met later that day. And on the 13th of August, Treasury Council attended Bow Street magistrates and informed them that after it had been represented that the object and intention of the article was not an endeavour to induce men to insurrection, the DPP withdrew the prosecution. MPs, and indeed the former Attorney General F.E. Smith, then Lord Birkenhead, began to speculate as to who it was that had made such representations it being wholly unconstitutional for the executive to exert pressure on the attorney for political motives. A censure motion was tabled in the Commons, and the issue became a matter of confidence in the first Labour government. Ramsay MacDonald frankly vacillated in his recollection of events during the debate, but insinuated that the attorney had merely sought the Cabinet's guidance. This version of events was rejected by the House, the motion was carried, and the first Labour administration was ousted. When Stanley Baldwin became Prime Minister, 
he revealed the express instruction from the cabinet made on the 6th of August of 1924, which stated that no political prosecutions should be directed by the attorney without the sanction of cabinet. Quite properly, successive governments distanced themselves from this edict. By 1951, the then attorney, Sir Hartley Shawcross, defined the principles guiding prosecutions in terms familiar to prosecutors today when he said this, there is no greater nonsense than the suggestion that in all cases the Attorney General ought to decide to prosecute merely because he thinks there is what the lawyers would call a case. Before he said that, and I quote, the Attorney General and the Director of Public Prosecutions only intervene to direct a prosecution when they consider it in the public interest. And yet the position of the attorney vis-a-vis -vis public prosecutions was still not wholly comfortable. It was the attorney Sir Reginald Manningham Buller who sought advice from the Foreign Secretary in 1956 when the Soviet discus thrower Nina Ponomoreva was caught shoplifting from British department stores in what was coined by the popular press as the case of the slipped discus. Don't shoot the messenger. Manning and Buller unquestionably acted constitutionally, but the case typified the difficult position of a law officer in acting and being seen to act justly. And no discussion of the law officer's public prosecutorial function would be complete without a mention of that same attorney's prosecution of Dr John Bodkin Adams in 1957. Dr Adams was a GP in Sussex. Several dozen of his patients had died in suspicious circumstances, having made Dr. Adams a beneficiary under their wills. Dr. Adams was suspected of several counts of murder, but at that time, only one count could be indicted at a time. It was envisaged that the Crown would present each case consecutively in descending order of evidential strength. In 1957, Sir Reginald, or Bullying Manor, as he was irreverently nicknamed by some, prosecuted Dr. Adams for the murder by lethal injection of Edith Morell, presumably the Crown's strongest case. The trial, the reason why we know so much about it, is the subject of what is still the most unusual kind of book, written about a criminal trial by the judge who presided over it, albeit many years later. Lord Devlin's Easing the Passing is a must-read for anyone who is interested in or who conducts criminal litigation. It presents a, shall we say, less than hagiographical picture of the Attorney General in his preparation and presentation of the case. Putting it in a nutshell, and I recommend the book as a must-read for every student of law and indeed every member of this inn, the prosecution's case fell apart when the defence admitted into evidence treatment records that the police, for some reason, had been unable to recover, and expert witnesses for the prosecution spontaneously gave contradictory evidence. The jury acquitted Adams after 46 minutes. Now, it was widely expected that the attorney would continue with the second murder indictment or offer no evidence, but to the astonishment of uh, Mr Justice Devlin, as he then was, the attorney instead entered a nolly prosequi on the grounds that Adams could not be guaranteed a fair trial given the frenzied media attention in relation to the first verdict. Now, a nolly prosequi is a formal withdrawal of the Queen's consent for a prosecution. They're normally made on compassionate or public interest grounds, not because the prosecution has a weak case. Now, the power still exists today, although it is seldom exercised and only in particular cases where the circumstances are clear and no alternative means of dealing with proceedings is apparent. Now, Lord Devlin considered Manning and Buller's explanation to be, shall we say, specious. He disparaged the use of the nolly as an abusive process that simply was designed to hide deficiencies in the prosecution's case. And naturally, it left Dr Adams to his dying day as a man under suspicion, as a mass murderer. Now, to add some balance to the uh, criticism of Manning and Buller's courtroom shortcomings, he did maintain a very principled stance during the Suez Crisis of 1956, when a triumvirate of nations attacked Egypt following its national, nationalisation of the Suez Canal. 
Confidential documents re released in 2006 relate how he and the then solicitor, Sir Harry Hilton Foster, had warned Eden, who was then Prime Minister, uh, and warned the Foreign Secretary repeatedly that there was no legal justification for that attack. I'm going to pause briefly at this stage to build on the allusion to both Sir Hartley Shawcross and international affairs because it's an opportunity to speak about the rare occurrence of law officers appearing before international tribunals. As attorney, Sir Hartley led the United Kingdom's prosecutorial team at the Nuremberg trials with 22 senior Nazi officials. And practically speaking, he made the opening and closing speeches but they were speeches that were widely lauded for their lack of moralistic and crusading oratory. Instead, they focused on the primacy of international law, the prohibition of aggression and criminal acts committed in the fog of war. And while condemning as pusillanimous the defence of superior orders, he said the following, there comes a point when a man must refuse to answer to his leader if he is also to answer to his own conscious conscience powerful words indeed and ably assisting shawcross was david maxwell fife himself a former attorney who conducted the day-to-day -day aspects of the case including a famous cross-examination of herman goering maxwell fife who was later lord chancellor was subsequently instrumental in drafting the european convention on human rights and also acting as junior counsel was a future attorney sir elwin Jones, my fellow Clinetliite and later Lord Chancellor. So I'm not the first boy from Clinetli to become a law officer. The law officers continue to present cases to international tribunals, albeit infrequently, but in recent years, both the former Attorney General Dominic Grieve and indeed I have presented cases to the International Court of Justice regarding the United Kingdom's dispute with Mauritius over sovereignty of the British Indian overseas territories. Returning to the historical developments and the role of the law officers, it might surprise you to learn that until 1892, the law officers were allowed to balance their manifold public duties with often very lucrative private practices. Naturally, this double life entailed admittedly rather self-inflicted injuries, the extent of which was relayed in 1850 by Sir John Jervis to the Select Committee on Official Salaries when he said this, Anyone who has not held the office can have no conception of the labours of an Attorney General. I am kept officially in the House of Commons to two or three o'clock in the morning sometimes, and I'm obliged to be in court again at half past nine the following morning. Poor man. By the 1870s, the attorney and solicitor were effectively salaried ministers, paid £7,000 and £6,000 respectively for non-contentious work, with further ad hoc fees for contentious government work. Now, according to the Bank of England's inflation calculator, a £7,000 salary back in 1871 equates to roughly 809000 in today's money, which rather attenuates one's sympathy for Mr Attorney Jervis's crammed schedule. A man can dream. The Commons became increasingly vociferous in its calls for law officers to abandon private practice, whose precedence over their public duties was inhibiting their ability to opine on the legal effects of government measures in the House. And the death knell for the arrangement sounded with the famous case of Charles Parnell in 1892. Some five years before, the Times newspaper had published letters that had ostensibly been signed by Parnell, who was, of course, the charismatic Member of Parliament and leader of the Irish Nationalists in the House of Commons. The letters uh, condoned the murders of Lord Frederick Cavendish and other members of the government in Dublin's Phoenix Park some uh, years before. Now, Parnell declined to bring libel proceedings against the Times, although a fellow Irish Party member brought a constructive libel claim against it. The Attorney General of the day, Sir Richard Webster, defended the Times and O'Donnell's claim failed. But Parnell continued to protest that the letters were forgeries, so a statutory commission was established to inquire into their veracity. The commission found that the letters were indeed forgeries, when on the 50th day of the hearing, Richard Piggott, the journalist that had passed them to the Times, entered the witness box. After two days of cross-examination, he confessed to having forged the letters himself. Mr Attorney Webster, 
who was the Crown's chief prosecutor and the guardian of the traditions and honour of the Bar of England, was publicly denigrated for what was seen to be woeful incompetence in failing to see the unreliability of Piggott. Observing that it was not sustainable to permit law officers to represent private clients when meeting their public obligations, the Prime Minister, Gladstone at the time, forbade the law officers from engaging in private work, although he did furnish them with their own department shortly thereafter. Now, prior to this arrangement, the law officers had previously operated from chambers, supported by just a clerk or two. And it was Sir William Harcourt who describes a mirthful scene uh, which was precipitated by this arrangement when he was appointed solicitor in 1873, when he writes, two cabs arrived, filled with a number of miscellaneous old volumes, which were tumbled out into the street and were ultimately brought up into my room. Among the volumes, he continues, were the most important and confidential papers, which in the Foreign Office would have been treated with the greatest secrecy and would have gone about in red boxes in the custody of officials, but between the law officers went from one set of chambers to another in open envelopes and were tumbled about from boy to boy. With a plethora of political, public interest and professional obligations, it is the lot of a law officer to serve many masters and undertake our duties assiduously in a manner that is and is perceived to be just. And this can occasionally be somewhat treacherous terrain upon which to operate. Uh, and it is likely for that reason that Sir Francis Bacon described the role of attorney as one of the most painfulest places in the kingdom. Because unlike other ministers, we law officers remain fully subject to the ethical and professional codes of our profession, the bar, and the supervision of our professional bodies too. Uh, take the case of Sir John Hobson, who was attorney in the early 60s. Uh, he was attorney when Anthony Enahoro, who was a Nigerian pro-democracy activist, found himself accused in Nigeria of, of treasonable felony. He escaped to London. But the government of Harold Macmillan refused to grant him political asylum and extradited him. The Commons voted to deport him in the belief that he would be allowed counsel of his choice in Lagos. This was later denied by the government of Nigeria. Enahoro was convicted and sentenced to 15 years' imprisonment. And it was in May of 1963 that a motion was tabled before the House, censuring the Home Secretary and, by implication, the attorney, for failing to disclose that Enahoro's British legal representatives would be barred from entering Nigeria. The motion was rejected, but Sir John was nevertheless summoned before the Masters of Arin to answer charges of unprofessional conduct. It was uh, judged that the charges were unfounded and that the attorney's conduct was indeed beyond reproach. But the episode demonstrates the somewhat tricky position that perhaps we occupy in being accountable to many different masters. The attorney and I continue to occupy, shall we say, a unique constitutional role. Whilst we now know and play almost no role in direct civil or criminal litigation, we superintend the departments that do this work independently. And I've mentioned them to you already. Superintendence means that we are accountable to Parliament for the performance of those departments. We achieve this by presenting annual reports, answering written and oral questions, and corresponding with members of Parliament. Now, we're not operationally in control of the departments, and we're not involved in managing individual cases. Each organisation, as you know, has its own director who is responsible for that day-to-day -day administration. But they consult us on their objectives, their strategic planning and their high-level decision-making. We may occasionally issue guidance on specific matters and launch inquiries into their work. And following recent disclosure failings in our criminal justice system, the attorney ordered a review that published its recommendations in November of last year. Now, our role as guardian of the public interest encompasses numerous discrete functions. For example, we retain some very, very rarely used functions related to ecclesiastical and royal matters, as well as some more regularly used uh, functions regarding charities and the appointment of advocates to the court uh, who are there to advise impartially on niche points of law. However, in the case of certain criminal offences, our consent is still required. Why, you may ask? 
Well, back in 1972, uh, the Home Office, who were then uh, responsible for the entirety of the criminal justice system, uh, apart from the Lord Chancellor and his role with the judiciary, gave five reasons. First of all, they said that it ensures consistency in prosecutions where the offence cannot be precisely defined and where the law may consequently go wider than the mischief aimed at it. Secondly, that it prohibits vexatious private prosecutions, a very important function that we still have. Thirdly, that it allows greater account to be taken of any mitigating factors. And fourthly, it provides central control over the criminal law where it intrudes into areas that are particularly sensitive. And finally, that it enables prosecutions to take account of public policy or international issues, but not, as we saw earlier, to be directed by the executive. So the power for consent is one that I use in relation to explosive substances, into terrorism offences with a foreign element, particularly relevant when it comes to returning foreign fighters, and also any conspiracy, uh, uh, conspiracy charges that involve an extra jurisdictional aspect. And the law officers have a further function pursuant to Section 13 of the 1988 Coroner's Act, which gives us the power to make or permit an application to the High Court for an inquest or a fresh inquest into a person's death. And the most high-profile use of that function was in 2012, when Dominic Grieve applied for a fresh inquest successfully into the deaths of the 96 who died at Hillsborough. Another ancient part of our public interest functions is our authority to bring proceedings for contempt of court, which, as you know, is broadly defined as an act or a mission calculated to interfere with the administration of justice. Now, common examples of this type of breach include breaches of court orders or publishing information that is potentially prejudicial to a trial. The most high-profile contempt issues which the law officers have been involved in recent years relate to John Venables and Robert Thompson, the murderers of James Bulger, whose identities are protected by a High Court injunction. Now, the law officers have played two roles here. First of all, acting as guardians of the public interest in proceedings regarding the injunction's imposition and its amendment, as well as bringing proceedings against those who breach its terms. Now, one of the busiest public interest functions of the law officers in the modern age is the unduly lenient sentence scheme, which was introduced exactly 30 years ago. We have the power to refer a criminal sentence to the Court of Appeal if we consider it so low that no judge could reasonably consider it appropriate. The scheme applies to indictable only and to some either way offences. Now, last year, over a thousand cases were drawn to officials' attention at the Attorney General's office. Of those, the law officers referred 140 to the Court of Appeal and the Court found 107 of them to be unduly lenient. It is a power that we exercise carefully and jealously. The threshold is a high one. And we personally, as law officers, exercise it as lawyers, not as politicians. Uh, and as long as I am in office, that will certainly remain the case. And like the law officers before us, our primary duty is to advise the government on potential legal issues arising from proposed policy and legislation. It was summarised, I think, very neatly by another mentor of mine, the great Lord Mayhew, who was solicitor and attorney. And he said this, the attorney has a duty to ensure that the Queen and ministers who act in her name, or purport to act in her name, do act lawfully, because it is his duty to help secure the rule of law the principal requirement of which is that the government itself acts lawfully. And the main way in which we perform this duty is our membership of the Cabinet's Parliamentary Business and Legislation Committee. That is the committee that decides which legislation should be included in the government's programme in each session of Parliament. And it's a committee that, rather like a star chamber of old, considers the readiness of that legislation. And I'm glad to say that many, most sensible ministers uh, will come before that committee with a sense of trepidation lest they fail uh, to discharge the burden that we place upon them. And the law officers must agree that legislation meets the requirements of legal certainty before it is ready to be introduced. And when legal issues are identified, the committee looks to us for the, for the advice on the implications of those issues and how best to mitigate them. And departments must seek our consent 
if proposed legislation is to have any retrospective effect or if it is to be commenced early, by which I mean within two months of royal assent. The law officers have a further role in relation to legislation because when a bill is introduced, uh, the minister in charge uh, of the bill in each house is required by section 19 of the Human Rights Act of 1998 to state that the bill's provisions are compatible with convention rights. And if the minister cannot provide that assurance, they must state that the government wishes the house to proceed nonetheless. So we law officers then consider the legal analysis the departments are required to produce for that committee which will include an analysis of the ECHR rights, an assessment of any interferences and any justifications for them. And the department demonstrates its human rights law reasoning with a view to satisfying us, and so therefore the committee and the government. So that the route by which the department has come to the conclusion that the bill is compatible is the correct one. Now the cabinet manual outlines many scenarios that might require the advice of law officers, but in short, we are asked to advise on any issue concerning the legality, uh, either domestically or internationally, or the constitutional propriety of proposed legislation and executive action. Now, the convention that I talked about prevents me from divulging specific items of advice, uh, but uh, as you know, it has two stages. First of all, it prevents the divulgence of the fact that advice has been given, and secondly, the content of that advice as well. And that is vital to good government. It's part of the glue that ensures the indivisibility of collective decision-making within Cabinet. Now, the Convention recently came under sustained attack as a result of an humble address motion that was passed by the Commons that required disclosure of the attorney's advice in relation to Brexit, and in particular, the legal advice of the so-called Northern Irish Protocol in the withdrawal agreement, the backstop, which we all have probably heard enough about. Uh, both the attorney and I thought that the convention was something worth defending, and I did just that in the debate on the humble address before Christmas. I can't deny that the outcome was anything other than difficult for the government. The advice was then published in response to a contempt motion that was passed by the Commons. My good friend and predecessor, Sir Edward Garnier, once described the law officers to me as the submarines of government, who only surface when something is up. At the moment, such is the turn of events that you may think we have no need of a periscope. But I uh, would end it this way, by saying that the future of the law officers, however unique, however tension-filled it might be, however anomalous it might seem, remains very much a bright one. Thank you very much indeed.